So my name is Jale Faisalahi, and I'm a computational linguist here at Uber in the conversational AI group. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, what is conversational AI, uh, why does Uber care about conversation, um, and then how do you quantify language as a data science, and uh, what does it mean to be a computational linguist at Uber? So what is conversational AI? Well, it's creating an agent that can speak with one or more humans to achieve a task. Uh, or to have a more open-ended chit-chat kind of a conversation. So in this case, so the system is helping the human send a text message. And you probably know conversational AI by other names like chatbots, intelligent digital assistants, uh, automated voice assistants. Uh, there's some famous fictional examples like Hal from 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Cortana from the video game Halo, uh, and Samantha from the movie Her. And you surely know that some of the industry products like Siri, uh, Cortana, the Google Assistant, Alexa, just to name a few. Uh, so why does Uber care about conversational AI? Uh, well, for efficiency and seamlessness, um, being able to give um, drivers and cyclists the ability to interact with the app through their voice uh, enables them to drive more, uh, more safely and efficiently um, and focus on, on, on the task. Uh, so our team has developed and shipped to a limited set of drivers and two features that reduces the need to touch the screen. Uh, so one is the dispatch bot. So the uh, system will alert the driver by voice um, of a new incoming trip and they can accept or reject through their voice. Um, and then voice reply where um, the system will read out a, write a message from the writer and they can respond um, by voice as well. So let's look at a short demo of each of these. This is the dispatch. Incoming trip request, you can say things like yes to accept. Mm, okay, let's do it. Great, we'll dispatch you to Arjun. And then this one's the voice reply. New message from Yizzy. I'm waiting by the Starbucks. Do you want me to respond? Tell Yizzy I'll be right there. Okay, sure. Ready to send it? Send it. Great. Message sent. Yep. So let's dive into a little bit into the how we develop a product like this and look at the life cycle. Um, so first we start with a, an idea for a model or a feature uh, and a program manager or a scientist will come to me um, usually with a couple of examples and it's my job to expand on those examples um, and find data for them to model and train on. Uh, so part of what makes uh, creating an automated assistant difficult is that language is so varied. There's a many to many mapping. Um, so we can say the same thing in many different ways. Um, so for here, um, when there's a new incoming trip, would you like to accept? You can say a variety of things to, ac to accept it. You could say yes, add the trip, sure, why not? Go ahead, I'll do it. Um, and then here, if you wanted to reject, you could say no, reject the trip, cancel, ignore. Um, and if you didn't want to respond to a text message, you could say something like ignore, I'm driving now, not right now, later. Um, and then similarly, the same thing can mean different things in different contexts. Um, so language is highly contextual. We, uh, the, the meaning of the message depends on what question was asked, who is speaking, the location, what's on the screen. Um, and you can see here that um, no, cancel, ignore could either mean don't add the trip to my queue or it can mean don't respond to this message. And so I might use um, open source data sets as a jumping off point, um, apart from the fact that we uh, open source data sets cannot be used in commercial products. Um, there's often like a, a mismatch in the type of data that exists there. So uh, the switchboard corpus is um, conversations between two people uh, over the telephone. Um, and they're labeled with um, a, set, a set of labels. Um, and in this case, they have one for confirm or agree. And so in the middle here, you can see um, there's a set of data that probably would work for our case. Um, so sure, yeah, uh-huh. Um, but they're surely not gonna have things like uh, add the trip or accept. Um, and then um, there's cases that are not appropriate to our context. So um, in the case of, of switchboard, the confirm agree is really more of a back channeling. So back channeling is basically those, um, those, uh huh, I see. Oh, interesting. Those kind of those messages that you say to indicate that you're still listening. 
Uh, so those are, would not be appropriate to this context. Um, and then sometimes there's data sets that look really, you know, very close to exactly our, our domain. So the taxi domain um, from the Microsoft end to end dialogue challenge, it looks like it's, you know, if you were going to build a bot that could help the writer book a taxi, that seems like it's right on target. Um, except that um, we have lots of like Uber specific uh, information that we need from the, the user. So we might need to know like what product type they want. Is it an Uber X, a pool, um, assist? Um, and then other th uh, information the system would want to return to the user, like estimated wait times, prices, um, the driver information. Um, and then uh, those, uh, the Microsoft end to end dialogue challenge was uh, crowdsource data. So they were kind of pretending to, two people pretending to book a ride. Um, but that data set won't have some of the, the real world sort of non happy paths that you'd expect in a real system. Uh, so something like, um, what if the system can't find the location and has to confirm? Um, or what if the user cancels mid-conversation? How do we handle that? Um, user, uh, the user corrects information on the prior turn. Um, or like what happened, you know, model errors surely will happen. And the, the user has to then like make subsequent corrections. So all of that requires um, data we need, uh, that we need to learn from. So how do I get data? Uh, well, like similar to the Microsoft uh, challenge, I'll crowdsource data. Um, and there's a couple of ways I can get data. I'll, I'll provide um, a couple of prompts. So there's one where we can have paraphrases where I can um, give them a the few examples and they'll give me several variations on that particular example. So accept the trip can turn into, I'll take it, I'll take the trip, I'll do it, sure. Um, then yes, it can also be the other variants of that. Um, or I can give them a more open-ended prompt, like, uh, how would you respond to a new incoming trip? And you kind of might get a bit more, uh, more phrases there. Um, but the problem with both of these methods is that they're subject to linguistic priming. So linguistic priming is sort of whatever words I use is, are going to be mimicked back to me. Um, so if I use something like accept and trip, I'll get a lot of data that use those words. Um, similar and the same thing in the direct prompt, they use the word trip um, and it occurs in all of those phrases. Um, and so I might miss out on cases where people say things like job, I'll do that job, I'll take it, um, right, or, or maybe the ride. Um, so the best way to like mitigate this is to just collect in a lot of different ways. You know, you might change all of your different, your wording. I might say, you know, how would you respond to a new, new ride um, or offer? Um, and then to, the best thing also is to just create the minimum viable product and get your, start to get your real data. Um, and so um, that's also important because uh, the real data is, is also subject to linguistic priming once you have your product to, uh, to put together and you have a, a user interface. Um, so if you have a very um, defined prompt like say yes to accept, you'll get things like pretty much just yes and accept. Um, but if you have an open-ended uh, question, like how would you like to respond, you might get a lot more varied responses. Um, and designers love to play around with uh, the wording to get the most sort of natural experience, also do what's best for the product. And so your model has to be uh, robust to all of those kinds of changes. Yeah. So now that I have all this kind of data, it has to, I have to put some structure around it. Uh, and we call that a schema or an ontology. Uh, so basically, what I'll, I'll take these variations and we'll come up with a, an intent for each action. So an intent is basically what does the user want the system to do? Um, it's a classification label. Um, and then the slots, which are portions of the text which correspond to parameters for that task. Uh, so in this case, uh, we would have an intent to reply and then a slot would highlight the words or you know, span the, find the span of text corresponding to the message, which is say, I will be right there. Um, and together, this would constitute the semantic frame or the meaning of, of the utterance. And this would then uh, be turned into the, by the system into some sort of action or card and display to the user uh, to confirm. And then similarly, if they say don't respond or cancel, uh, that maps to another intent for ignore where the system should appropriately you know, do nothing. Uh, yeah, so now I have, very I have data and I have a, a labeling schema. Uh, we have to get this labeled. Um, and it's actually a little bit more complicated than you might expect at first glance. Um, so as we all know, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> uh, models just learn whatever is in the data and there's uh, whatever patterns exist. So we have to build that pattern, in, uh, those patterns into our data set. Um, and that's basically your business logic about what should the model do in different cases. 
Um, so the first two utterances here, their uh, yes, I'll do it, are very clearly accept um, intents. But then what do you do in the case where the user is hedging when they say, why not? I think so, I guess, maybe. Uh, so should we err on the side of accepting the trip and then risk that the driver has to cancel? Uh, or should we err on the side of rejecting and then the driver might potentially lose out on earnings? Um, or maybe we have a follow-up turn to like confirm uh, what they really want to do. Um, but that could then frustrate the driver that this is taking a whole lot longer than it just, you know, a simple tap. Um, what do we do in cases where there's a conditional? Like, should we um, just do nothing? Um, and then there are other cases where on the individual word basis, they look like an agree, but an intonation could maybe change your interpretation. interpretation. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> so all of these have to be thought of and, and, and you have to train your labeler, your annotators to build that into the data as they're labeling. So now we have labeled data and we can actually, we can start modeling. So yeah, how do we quantify language? How do we turn words into some sort of numerical form that the models can uh, start making predictions from? Um, so the basic idea is that um, a good quote from Firth, which is, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, so basically we can count co-occurrences of words um, and count those frequencies to come up with features. Uh, so for n-grams, we can take uh, sequences of two, three, or more words um, and count those frequencies for each category or document. Um, or a bag of words, which is the same idea, but doesn't preserve the order of words. Um, and then there's uh, TF-IDF, or term frequency, inverse document frequency, uh, which basically is trying to find what's the relevant, uh, relevance of this word for a document or a category. Um, so it will uh, take, it would, try and find how frequent is this word in the document, and then how many overall documents uh, mention this word. Uh, so something like the would be maybe highly frequent, but every document would probably mention that. So it would have a low score and not have a very high relevance. Uh, but something like the word taxi and docu or, uh, economy might have a very high mention in one particular document, but not all of them would mention that. So that would indicate that it was much more relevant. Um, and then word embeddings, which uh, thank you, Mo, for the great <laughs> explanation of that. Um, and this is really kind of what is used now. Um, Ngrams and TF-IDF are kind of uh, out of style, I guess, <laughs> the 90s. Um, so word embeddings we are, are vectors that represent the meaning of a word. And we find uh, windows of, um, we find the words that occur surrounding a target word um, of windows of a certain length and um, count those co-occurrences to create a vector and it should be able to map, map onto a semantic space. Uh, so we take all of these features, and for each word, we can construct a matrix. Um, and then this matrix starts to look like something familiar that you can train a neural net and do uh, text classification over. Uh, so taking a closer look at word embeddings, uh, we can map onto a, 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 a two-dimensional space. Um, and represent that, or something like oranges and strawberries, fruits might appear close together, um, but a word like doctor would appear further away. Um, and then a, a somewhat synonym might appear very close to that word, uh, the word doctor. Um, and an interesting uh, task we can do uh, and ask from these models is an analogy task. So we can ask uh, king is to queen as man is to, and we'll come up with uh, woman. Uh, and unfortunately, it learns uh, biases, whatever biases exist in our data set, um, and it will come up with incorrect analogies like uh, doctor is to nurse. Um, yeah, so more appropriate to uh, our context, to the Uber context, is that uh, word embeddings trained on general data sets won't reflect the particular meanings at Uber. Uh, so pool in a general data set will probably have uh, similar words or uh, nearby words like Swimming, pond, resource, puddle, water. Um, express might have things like checkout lane, uh, might be close to words like describe or demonstrate. And, and trunk might have like two meanings embedded in the same uh, vector. Um, so like elephant uh, for the trunk, or it could also be the car or a boot. Uh, but at Uber, pool has a very specific meaning. So it might appear next to other words like share, riders, cheaper, fair. Um, express pool, which is the um, option to walk a couple of blocks to meet your driver, um, will appear thing next to words like walk, driver, uh, blocks, um, and trunk will have probably one sense of the word. 
So once engineering your model, um, all uh, design has all come together, you can start releasing your product um, to some drivers. And uh, once you see the real data, it's very messy. <laughs> and you most likely didn't train your model on this type of messy data. So you have to take a look at uh, how your model is performing and what types of errors you're, you're making. And, what, and also how to train uh, labelers on um, how to label this kind of data. So we have things like radio or side speech. So you might have something like clearly an accept yes please and you'll capture, you know, see you soon. Um, or something like radio, like today in Congress, something up. Like that. Um, yeah. I put that in before <laughs> some of the news. Um, yeah, or you might find like a, a very similar type of accept, but it's actually grammatically incorrect in that context. So I canceled it, like being the past tense. Should that be a reject? Um, or you'll get speech recognition errors where you're missing a phoneme um, or um, the yeah, homophone like uh, E-X-C-E-P-T um, or just one phoneme is, is replaced. So how do you label those kinds of uh, things as well? Way around kind of handling these problems are very dependent on your model and the situation. So for speech recognition, there's maybe some acoustic models you can work with. Um, but uh, whether or not you're going to err on the side of accepting or rejecting really um, kind of is very model dependent and uh, also depends on the distribution of your data. So it's, there's no one method to fix those kinds of things. Um, and then metrics. We need to know the usual things about how our product is doing. Uh, what is, are the daily active users? Um, the model accuracy. We look very, take a close look at the confusion matrix. Um, and then especially the top utterances. What are the common things people are saying? We really want to make sure those are uh, what we're passing on those um, type of utterances and doing the right thing. Yeah. So one thing that the life cycle diagram doesn't really demonstrate well is that at each of these stages, we're um, collecting new data, we're adding to the data set, uh, we're updating, we're making changes to the labels. Um, and you have to have a good system that will track and store um, this kind of data. And it has to be GDPR compliant as well, um, which is the European standard for um, protecting data privacy and security of, of data. Um, yeah. So what does it mean to be a computational linguist? Well, I wear many hats. Um, I do everything from data collection design, um, the schema and the guidelines, um, working with engineers on the data pipeline and tools. Um, I can be a data manager. I can work on active learning, uh, which is selecting, uh, intelligently selecting data um, that will most help your model uh, or to get that labeled and then feed that back into your, uh, in your model training. Um, error analysis, uh, model, and product metrics. And in reality, I spend most of my time in these areas. Um, they're not very sexy uh, jobs or <laughs> topics, um, but in my experience, that's what really can make or break the success of your team. And speaking of team, there's an entire team working on conversational AI. Um, it takes uh, data scientists, researchers, engineers, uh, team leads, designers, uh, producers, uh, and they're all very smart and hardworking, and I feel really lucky to get to work with them. Um, I think, yeah, so we can go beyond voice assistance. Um, I'm going to just quickly skip this for um, say the time's sake. Um, but you can definitely go beyond um, voice assistance when working in the natural language processing areas. And so those are just to name a few. Uh, what is conversational AI? An agent that uh, assists humans. Uh, why does Uber care about Conv AI? Well, it's uh, for efficiency and a seamless experience. Um, there's many different ways to quantify language. You can talk to me or my colleagues if you're interested in, in that area. Um, and then to be a computational linguist, you wear many hats um, and you get to, I get to be involved in the entire product life cycle. So, thank you.